are related uh, on the methodological side to what Ilya was presenting and uh, substantively to what Oleg talked about yesterday, but with a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, so I'll give you my intake uh, on the whole thing. So um, as an introduction, uh, repeating a bit maybe my introduction of yesterday, but uh, that's probably useful. It's really documented that there's a lot of uncertainty in lifetime earnings and that these uncertainties gradually resolved over time. So it, it's not resolved at the beginning of life or when you enter the labor market or, or anything like that. And the question that we want to ask is uh, how we can set taxes to provide good insurance uh, in those contexts. Okay. Uh, and in the context of static models, uh, starting, I guess, with uh, Milton Freeman's idea of the negative income tax formalized by ATAN, and then uh, the nonlinear models of Merleys that were recently uh, calibrated quite carefully by Diamond and Syed, uh, we have a pretty good idea of how to answer the question of redistribution and social insurance in a static context. But I want to argue that these models are not very useful uh, to answer the specific questions uh, that I'm interested in. Okay? The specific questions have to do with the fact that uh, there is uncertainty, but this uncertainty is resolved gradually over time. And it's something that needs to be taken into account. So why are those models not well suited to answer that question? Well, first, uh, because they have a symmetric treatment of redistribution and insurance behind the veil of ignorance. And it's not clear that we want to have, to, to have, we want to have the same attitudes toward redistributions and towards social insurance. So I'd like to be able to make uh, a difference. The second one, which is, I think, even more problematic, is that it's very hard to know how to interpret a period in those models. So typically, those calibrations take a model to be a period to be a year. But then that means that every period is taken in isolation, with no link between periods. Okay? And that's clearly uh, unsatisfactory. An alternative is to say well, one period is going to be a lifetime. Okay? But then you're restricting the set of instruments because you're only going to tax lifetime earnings. And maybe there are some gains from doing something a little more sophisticated. Maybe not, okay? but it's something that we'd like to learn. So the question of how to set taxes to provide good social insurance in the dynamic context is still a bit open to some extent. Okay? And we want to uh, fill that gap. Of course, you know, this is a bit the overarching question of this new literature on intertemporal public economics or new dynamic public finance. And there's been some progress uh, on these questions, but mostly for technical reasons, because as you've probably understood, these are in general hard models to, to solve or to characterize analytically or, or numerically. Most progress has been on particular cases uh, where the problem really simplifies. And one crucial dimension of complexity or simplification has to do with, uh, so these are models with pride information. So if the pride information doesn't have much persistence, if it's IID over time, then it's very easy to handle. If there, if there is persistence in the pride information, it's much more complicated. Okay? It's much more complicated to handle uh, the, incentive cons the set of incentive constraints. So it, theoretically, it's complicated. And numerically, it becomes quite intractable because the state space that you would need to represent those, uh, those problems recursively uh, explodes. So basically, uh, the cases that we know how to solve are IID or some special version of the stochastic process, like an absorbing shock. So if you think about disability insurance or unemployment insurance and something like that. Okay. There, are this very simple Markov structure with an absorbing state allows you to, uh, to have uh, a pretty thorough treatment of these cases. But apart from that, we really don't know. Uh, and from an applied perspective, uh, if you want to say, okay, what kind of uncertainty are people facing, we have a pretty good idea. I mean, there's some controversy of you know, exactly how big the shocks are, exactly how persistent. But roughly speaking, uh, it looks like income is well approximated by some kind of geometric random walk and maybe some white noise around this. And there's a debate about whether this white noise is measurement error or something meaningful that we have to, uh, to take care of. But you have at least one component which is very persistent. So uh, basically, we don't have at this stage any theory that allows us to handle these cases. Okay? 
So uh, the particular cases that are simple to solve, unfortunately, you know, are not so useful uh, from a practical perspective for the question I'm asking. Then uh, the other focus of the literature so far, and uh, the, the paper I presented yesterday was a bit an illustration of this, uh, was a focus on savings distortions or capital taxation. And there are two reasons for that. The first one is that we don't have, any, we don't have so many theories in economics that uh, prescribe that we should tax capital from a normative perspective. And this is a candidate. So it attracted a lot of interest and a lot of attention. The second one is that it's an optimality condition that pops out very easily of, uh, of these problems. And you don't have to know much. You don't have to solve completely the model. Okay? It's a, a partial characterization that's very easy to obtain in quite general environments. Okay? So there's been quite a bit of work on that. But so what we want to do in this paper is, and, and partly also motivated by the paper I presented yesterday, which showed you that, yes, there is an argument for capital taxation, but the welfare gains aren't that large. Okay? So maybe what's really important is to understand how to set the other taxes to provide a good social insurance. And in particular, how to set labor taxes uh, to provide uh, social insurance. So that's what uh, we want to do today. We want to focus on, on, on labor distortions, and we'll also have saving distortions, in a very general setting. And we're going to be able to make progress both on the theoretical side, uh, and we'll be able to provide, I think, a pretty tight characterization for the evolution of labor taxes over time. And uh, also on the numerical side. Okay? So as I was telling you, uh, this problem that we're tackling is very challenging theoretically and numerically. So you could think, OK, it's a problem that I can't solve uh, analytically or can't say much about analytically, but that's OK. I'll just put it on the computer. It turns out to be very hard. Okay? So you can't do that. So uh, it's, 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 it's progress uh, to be able to do that. And I'll tell you exactly how we're able to make progress. And basically, it's about using a first order approach uh, exactly uh, along the lines that uh, Ilya was uh, outlining in his talk. And so basically, we're going to be able to characterize the full optimum. Okay? Uh, and then we'll be able to ask a bunch of questions regarding the optimum. Uh, questions that are, that are interesting and, and make us understand whether we should qualify the Milton Friedman or, or Shishinsky or Merlis prediction. You know? uh, so should taxes depend on age? Uh, should taxes depend on history? Should the overall tax system be progressive or regressive? Now, once we've characterized the optimum, you'll see that uh, you can actually implement this optimum with a set of taxes. Uh, but it requires quite sophisticated taxes. So these are not taxes that uh, would be easy to explain to your grandmother, okay, or to relate to actual tax codes. But because we, uh, we're going to be able to understand the full optimum and understand the forces that shape the optimum, we're going to be able to say, okay, let's try to see which of these forces are crucial. And maybe we can ignore some of them and come up with a simpler tax system that does a good job in terms of welfare. So really informed by our characterization of the full optimum, we're going to be able to study simple tax, simple tax systems. And in particular, we'll be able to emphasize a very simple tax system that does a very good job in terms of welfare. And that's much simpler than the full optimum. Okay? Uh, and basically, we're going to go back to a world of linear taxes that might depend on age. And I'll tell you exactly what's to be gained from. But basically, the overall conclusion is, uh, that we're going to find is that there are some gains from deviating from Milton Friedman or, or, or your paper, or just the negative income tax. These gains can be quantified. They're big, but not gigantic. And I can tell you exactly how to deviate from that. But that's also a bit of a way of you know, bringing this literature a bit closer to uh, things that are, that are uh, actually uh, discussed. And, and the overall finding, I think, is that Milton Friedman basically got it right. You know? And uh, a negative income tax is something that does a pretty good job uh, in those models. And you'll see some qualifications around this. But in the end, it delivers a pretty simple message. Okay? And this is for the numerical simulation that we have performed. 
And I'll tell you also that we've been able to cover some cases, but not all cases. So our method is powerful, but it's still very demanding. And so there's still a lot of work uh, to be done and to understand how general our conclusions are. Okay. So there's a lot of work uh, on that. I'm not going to, uh, to read it. So let me lay down uh, the environment. Um, so uh, you're going to have a bunch of uh, individuals. And I'm going to abstract from initial heterogeneity uh, in this model. Okay, because I really want to focus on social insurance. And later I'll come back to initial heterogeneity and I'll tell you how uh, you want to think differently maybe about redistribution and, and social insurance. But right now we're, we're putting all the focus on social insurance. So individuals are ex ante identical, so you can think of it as conditional on a type if there were heterogeneous types to begin with. And their utility uh, is very general at this stage. It's just time separable. Okay? Uh, and important, so they consume, and uh, this is their income in every period. And theta, is, uh, if you're in a Merlis model, it would be the, the wage that's unobservable. But you don't have to stick to this uh, interpretation. Uh, and the horizon is finite. So really, really have a, a life cycle uh, implication in mind. But we could have t as large as, as we want. And in fact, our results generalize to t equals infinity to, to, to support this particular application. So that's going to be an important object, the utility uh, from a given allocation and, and for some realization of shot. And this is going to be the cost of a given allocation. Okay, so it's just the net present value of consumption minus uh, labor income. And I'm discounting everything with a constant interest rate. So I'm working in partial equilibrium. Uh, and, and R is an interest rate. So I really want to, this is my general model, but I'm going to specialize it uh, for my uh, numerical applications to this model, which is a stripped down life cycle model. So you're going to take people when they enter the labor force at age 25, say. They're going to work for TE periods, okay? And that's going to be their utility uh, from working. So the same utility as in the Merlis model. And then for uh, the rest of the time, they're going to be in retirement. And the only difference is that they're not going to be able to work there. So they just uh, enjoy a consumption. OK? Uh, no. Okay, that's, I'll mention a bunch of extensions that we want to work on. And one of them is this one, to have endogenous retirement. For now, it's exogenous. So at age 65, you exit the labor force, no matter what kind of history you've experienced. And it's clearly something that would be interesting to work on, but uh, not here. I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll speculate a bit about uh, what happens there. OK? Now, uh, we're going to, uh, so in that model, you know, if theta, imagine that preferences were separable between consumption and leisure. If theta were observable, OK, with these preferences, then the solution would be very simple, would be the first best. So you equalize everybody's consumption, but you would ask, uh, you would make productive people work a lot and non-productive people not work very much. Uh, now, uh, one way to understand, you can intuitively understand that that's not something that uh, productive people are going to be very happy with. And if they have some private information on their productivity, they might want to cut back and pretend not to be so productive. So it wouldn't be incentive compatible in other words. Uh, so we're going to formalize this in the usual way. So this shock theta is going to be prior information. And uh, I'm going to be quite general on the evolution of this shock, uh, but I'm going to assume that it's Markov. Okay? And the reason for that is that uh, I want to present my results uh, in a recursive form. And uh, so that's going to help me do that. Uh, but it's a pretty general Markov process. Uh, so this is uh, the shock in the previous period. And this is uh, the support of the shock today as a function of the shock yesterday. So the support might be fixed or it might be moving around. Okay. Uh, the density uh, of the shock today, we're going to assume that it's differentiable. Okay. So these are continuous shocks uh, with a, a well-behaved uh, density. I'm going to start actually with the case of a fixed support. So a support that does not depend on the shocks that you received in the past. And I'll tell you uh, how things change uh, when you relax this assumption. 
So that's it. We have all the ingredients to set up uh, the planning problem that we're interested in. Uh, so the, it's really a planning problem where we say there's some trade-off that we have to, to, uh, uh, to resolve between the provision of insurance and the provision of incentives. And then we also have to decide how to deliver those incentives. Okay. So people have shocks. We're trying to insure them. But so there's some agency problem that comes from private information. And the corresponding planning problem that uh, incorporates uh, all these elements is the following. So uh, you're trying to minimize the discounted cost uh, of the allocation subject to delivering a given utility and incentive competitors. Okay. So sigma is just a, uh, a reporting strategy. And this is saying that the utility you get from truth telling is greater than the utility you get from uh, any other report. And this uh, corresponds, the value of the objective I'm going to call k0 of v. Okay, so the cost function are the function of the utility that you want to deliver to HS. Okay, so we're working in the dual. We could equally uh, work in the prime. It doesn't make uh, much of a difference. So that problem, uh, going back to what I was saying in the introduction, is not tractable except for special cases. And the problem is really that this set of incentive compatibility constraints is quite complicated. You don't know which incentive constraints are binding. And in particular, when you have persistent prior information, it becomes a bit of a nightmare. Okay. So the approach that we're going to take here is, is exactly the approach that, uh, that, uh, that Ilya explained. Uh, we're going to use a first order approach. So instead of solving this problem, we're going to solve the relaxed problem. Okay. Uh, and the relaxed problem is going to drop a bunch of incentive compatibility constraints. Okay? We're going to keep, in particular, only the local incentive compatibility constraints. So the only thing we're going to impose is that agents don't want to deviate just a little bit. Okay? But we're not going to worry about the fact that agents might want to deviate a lot. And it's a concern, because these things are not necessarily concave. Okay? So what we're going to do is, is solve the relaxed problem subject to these local incentive compatibility constraints. And then expose, where uh, once we solve the relaxed problem, we're going to verify whether it satisfies the global incentive compatibility constraints or not. Okay? So in this setup, we don't have uh, any theorem or any set of sufficient conditions that tells you when the, local, the, the relaxed problem is going to have the same solution as the original planning problem. So we'd like to have that, but we don't have it. So the way we're going to proceed is solve the relaxed problem. And then when we go to numerical applications, okay, uh, verify whether it solves the global incentive compatibility constraints or not. Okay? Is the risk, is this in the trying to think of you know, uh, labor risk over the life over the life cycle? Yeah. It's not just my risk of you know, productivity or relaxed cycle or aggregate risk. You know, if there's some business cycle fluctuation or something mm -hmm. like that. Do you think that will be hanging? No, so so I mean, a business cycle, the, everybody's experiencing the same shocks. So there isn't much to insure there. Everybody has to eat their share. So the only question is, I'm sorry? You could pull from other periods yeah. and say it's a bad state of the world, but consumption's valuable. For sure. But that's, that's a problem that's a bit orthogonal and, and kind of well understood. Uh, you know? So it's, it's the whole RBC literature is about that. Uh, it's about when you have a shock. Maybe you cut on investment, or maybe you invest a lot, so you, you borrow from future periods. Or maybe you can look at uh, the international versions of these models where you try to provide insurance across countries. So these are very interesting, but a bit uh, orthogonal to these ones. And you don't have the same issues of, of uh, obstacles to insurance. So typically, I mean, uh, the kind of frameworks that people use to, uh, to think about that uh, have complete markets, or if they have incomplete markets, they're limited by other frictions, like uh, the possibility to default and, and things like that. I think I was just thinking, rather than just having insurance across people, yeah. you could also have across time. But across time is not really insurance. So th the question that you could ask here is uh, insurance across generations, for example, okay, because I'm thinking of a life cycle model. Uh, so I could incorporate IVH shocks, but then I would really need to, I'm focusing on one generation here. The problem when you have multiple generation, it's true that you might want to share risk across generation, but you, you enter uh, tricky distributional issues that I don't have to face here. Because you, know, you don't know 
uh, how much you want to favor one generation versus another or some things like that. It's very interesting, uh, but it's a bit orthogonal. Okay. That's the basis for the thing that you're doing. Right? Yeah, security. for sure. It, it's very much part of it. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm not trying to say that it's not an interesting sure. problem, just that it's a bit different from, from this one. Okay? All right. So let's try to think about these uh, local incentive compatibility. And I'm going to, I could do it the way Ilya did it, um, but I'm going to try to set up recursive notation because that's the way I want to think about the, about the problem. So, uh, but really, you should think that it's very, uh, it's basically the same method. So um, imagine this is a, the notation for a history. So you have a history of shocks up to t. And this is the continuation utility uh, after this history. Okay, so you have your utility today. So the history includes the shock today. And then the continuation utility tomorrow. And the continuation utility tomorrow is going to be related to the object w. This is going to be the average over the possible realizations of the shock tomorrow of W. And the average, as you can see, depends on the realization of the shock too. Okay? So it's this dependence here that makes the problem hard. Okay? If this did not depend on theta t, it would be an easy problem to solve. Now we can derive uh, a necessary conditions for incentive compatibility, which is just an envelope condition. And it says that the partial derivative of this utility with respect to theta t has to be equal to uh, the partial derivative of u with respect to the true shock. Okay? So if you had a, a static model, this would be a very familiar condition. And now you have this extra object that comes from the fact that uh, the continuation utility also varies with the true shock. And this is something that you have to take into account. Okay? So that's uh, related to the, the impulse response term that, uh, that Ilya was uh, explaining yesterday. But our notation for it is going to be a bit different. We're going to call it delta. Okay? And this delta is, uh, so you see it's the same integral as the integral for continuation utility. But what we're interested in is how this integral depends on the true shock today. So it's the derivative of the density with respect to the true shock that matters. Okay? So you can see how it's very related to the impulse response functions that uh, Ilya was talking about. That's the way we code them in there. OK? So it's a dynamic uh, uh, generalization of, uh, uh, of the envelope condition that's used in Merlis that's been generalized a lot by Milgram and Segal. And it's been used also uh, recently in dynamic models by Kapishka and Williams. And there's this, this paper that, uh, uh, that Ilya presented that presents a, a very general theory of how to, uh, how to derive these, uh, these envelope conditions in dynamic environments. And it's just a version of that. OK? That's right. That's correct. So uh, you're going to see that actually we're going to do a lot of integration by parts back and forth. So I, I don't know if one is really more tractable uh, than the other. This one is a bit intuitive, and we start going with that one without thinking much about it, honestly. Uh, and it's going to do the job for us. But I'm sure that you could also do it differently. Uh, but you'll see it's gonna, this issue is going to come back uh, later. All right. So. Uh, that's uh, our necessary conditions for incentive compatibility. So you see that we need to keep track of uh, several objects when we move from one period to the other. Okay? In period t, I have to make sure that uh, I have to promise some utility to the agents. Okay? And this is going to be a state variable. I'm going to have to make sure that when I come into the next period, I actually deliver this utility. And you can think of these object, delta, as something that's also important to provide incentives in period t. Okay? But that's something that's related to the, allocate, to the continuation allocation. 
So it's also something that I'm going to have to make sure I deliver uh, from period t plus 1. So you can already see kind of intuitively that we're going to be able to build a recursive representation of the model with two state variables, v and delta. Okay, So that's uh, uh, our recursive representation. So you see that it's the, the k function that depends on v. So the same as the sequence problem I was laying down originally. But I introduced these two extra state variables. Okay, uh, This extra state variable, sorry, delta. And theta is just the exogenous state variable. It's the Markov process because there is persistence. And it might depend on time because there's a, a horizon, which is retirement. And the utility might depend on time also. And there is just very intuitive. Uh, so the period utility, the period cost is just uh, consumption uh, minus output. And then you have the discounted value of the cost tomorrow. And today, I have to keep track. Uh, I have to do a certain number of things. I have to deliver the utility that I promised. Okay, So this is this constraint, where uh, w theta is defined as before. It's the utility that times theta gets from this period on. And then uh, this is uh, the incentive constraint. Okay, So I have to make sure that the derivative of w with respect to theta is equal to uh, the partial derivative and then uh, incorporates the way the future depends on theta also. The same constraint that we saw before. But so I have to deliver this promise keeping and I have to deliver the delta that I promised in the previous period. Okay. So I had to make sure that the continuation utility varies in a certain way with the shock yesterday in order to provide incentive yesterday. Okay. And this is something I have to deliver on. Okay. So uh, this was the so this is this constraint here. So you have to keep two promises in a way. Okay? You keep a promise on utility, and, and uh, some people call this a threat keeping constraint. Uh, but you have to deliver your promise on delta also. OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's the same, yeah. 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 It's by no way unique. Uh, you can twist this, this uh, but we like this one. All right. So let me try to make an analogy uh, with a, a model of discrete shock. So, so you have to appreciate these results. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe it's a bit dry because it comes after lines of algebra. But as I told you, we have a very complicated problem. Okay? And we've managed to boil it down to a, a simple Bellman equation with two endogenous state variables. Okay? So it's something that's going to be challenging uh, numerically, but manageable. And theoretically, also, it's an object that's very easy to analyze. Okay? So uh, this representation is going to be extremely useful. Okay? Uh, let me try to put it a bit in perspective because there are some, some antecedents. So uh, there's a paper by Fernandez and Fellan in uh, Econometrica 2000 or 2001. Uh, and what they do is uh, they do finite shocks. But you can really think the, the first order approach is not, I mean, it's not really special to continuous shocks. It's just convenient. But you can think of an equivalent with discrete shocks. And I think uh, Ilya talked about it yesterday. So let's try to see uh, what they had. And, uh, and what the first approach uh, really does. So what they said is, OK, if you have uh, finite shocks like this, then you can build uh, a recursive representation of the original planning problem, not the relaxed planning problem. With uh, You just have to expand the state space quite a bit. Okay? And in particular, the cardinality of the state space is going to be the same as the cardinality of uh, the shocks. Okay? And basically, uh, you need to keep promises for people who lied in the past, okay, who reported a type, a certain type, but were really of a different type. Uh, and this is what uh, these VKs are. The cost function otherwise is very uh, standard. You know, you're just trying to minimize the cost today uh, plus the discounted cost tomorrow. You have these, uh, uh, these promise keeping constraints. And uh, these are just the, uh, the incentive compatibility. Now, what the relaxed problem does is you keep track only of the downward incentive compatibility constraint. So the true type was theta L yesterday. 
and we keep track of the guy whose type was really theta L yesterday, and the guy whose true type was theta L plus one, but reported theta L. Okay? And we have to make sure that uh, we keep our promise to that guy also. Okay? And uh, so you drop uh, uh, the, the set of equations. So you see that here also, with a finite number of shocks, you boil it down uh, when you do the first order approach to a Bellman equation with two state, with two in the two state variables. Okay? And intuitively, what we have is uh, V and then V dot. So it's a version of, it's, the, it's like V and VL plus one minus V, if you want to think of it. It's an equivalent uh, representation. Okay? So there's nothing mysterious uh, really in all this. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. In the continuous, uh, in the continuous type uh, uh, thing, or, or it's, it's kind of a simple idea. All right. Now uh, we're done with the, the setup and the exposition of the method. Uh, oh, let me say one thing. So just on the methodology once again. We have this Bellman equation, and we're using continuous types because it's slightly more convenient for us. Why? Because within a period, you see that we can treat this minimization as an optimal control problem. Okay? Uh, you have a state variable w of theta, and then you have an equation for the evolution of w of theta. So it's very similar to the optimal control approach that Merlis used uh, to solve his model. Uh, it's an advantage theoretically because it's very clean. And it's an advantage also uh, numerically because it's very fast uh, uh, to solve. Okay? So it's an optimal control problem within uh, a, a recursive structure. So uh, now I'm going to describe the, the results. Okay? And in order to describe these results, uh, it's going to be useful to think about wedges. And you heard a lot about them already, so I'm going to go fast here. Uh, so we're going to characterize an optimal allocation that solves the relaxed planning problem with the hope that it also solves the original planning problem. It's something that we're going to have to verify. Then uh, we can look at this allocation in many different ways. But one thing that we're interested in is to understand the distortions in this allocation. Okay, so at the first best, every marginal rate of substitution would be equal to the corresponding rate of marginal rate, the corresponding rate of transformation. Because you're not at the first best, Okay, there are going to be some wedges in those uh, optimality conditions. And in particular, there's going to, there might be a wedge in the intertemporal condition. It's like an implicit tax on capital. And there might be a wedge in the, in the labor-leisure equation. Okay? And that's like an implicit tax on labor. This is still short of an implementation. We're not talking about actual taxes. Okay? These are virtual taxes. But in any tax system that you build, the corresponding marginal tax rates would have to be equal to this virtual tax rate. Okay? So it's informative of actual tax system that you might be able to build. There are many tax systems that implement these allocations. Okay? I'm not going to talk about this much. There are uh, different alternatives that are suggested in the literature, except when I go uh, at the end of the, at the talk, where I'll try, to look about simple, I'll try to talk about simple tax systems. And then they, these will be actual implementations. They define the ways. Okay, that's right. There are definitions of tau k and tau l. So what do I need to read by this I of t and t r for that? So as I told you, it's a very stripped down life cycle model. Uh, and, and there are a number of obvious extensions that are important and uh, that people have to work on. So one of them is uh, human capital accumulation. And uh, so there's a paper that is being uh, presented in the poster sessions here that uh, deals with that a little bit. So that, that's clearly very important. Uh, I think it would be important to think about human, cap human capital accumulation on the job also and things like that. So I don't think the topic is exhausted, but that's uh, a very useful uh, contribution. Another one is to think about endogenous retirement. Uh, another one also, but that's been treated a bit uh, separately in a, in a good way, is you know these shocks to income uh, I mean, you can think of them as things related to the job market for a while. But at some point in the life cycle, it becomes dominated by health shocks. Uh, and then you want to think about disability insurance and things like that. So maybe you want to have a, a slightly uh, richer model to think about that. Okay, so it's a bit simple, uh, this language. 
All right. Now, I'm going to, mostly for expositional purposes, uh, I'm going to make a number of uh, simplifying assumptions, special assumptions on the utility function. But we treat the general case, in particular the case where the utility is non separable and things like that. Okay. So for now, just accept it as a, a way to go through the results in a simple way, and I'll, I'll generalize it later. It's also, by the way, what we're, the, the kind of functional form that we're going to work with in our numerical simulations. Okay. This is the kind of, I mean, if you take utility to be logarithmic, this is a version of balanced growth preferences that economists like to uh, work with uh, because they have good properties. All right, so uh, we have this familiar condition that characterizes the constraint optimum and we've talked a lot about and we don't have much more to say about it. So at the optimum, you have this inverse Euler equation. Okay, and that implies, uh, uh, as we discussed, that the tuple wedge is gonna be positive. Okay, so this is a condition that we, we wouldn't need this whole machinery uh, to derive. It's very easy to derive. Okay, you don't need to study the relaxed problem. So that's going to be the new part. Right? And uh, once again, something that we're going to generalize later, but uh, just to make the result very uh, stark, let me assume that on top of utility being separable between consumption and leisure, the disutility of work is uh, isoelastic. Constant uh, elasticity, constant fresh elasticity of labor supply. Not that we think that it's a very good assumption, but we wouldn't really be able to tell you in which way to deviate from that. So it's a good benchmark, okay? And for, I'm going to also specialize, and I'll generalize this later, the stochastic process. So I'm gonna take a geometric AR1. So the log of productivity is an AR1. When rho is equal to one, it would be a geometric random walk. Uh, uh, otherwise, you have some mean reversion. And I'm allowing for uh, a deterministic trend on top of this, okay? And this is trying to capture, uh, well, we talked about this, the fact that uh, you really see a hump shape uh, in earnings. So this hump shape we treat as predictable. I don't know if it's a great assumption, but that's, that's the way that we do it. And that's the way a lot of the labor literature deals with it also. So, um, so we'll be able to calibrate, in other words, to have a good idea of what this process looks like by looking at empirical studies. All right. So here's our proposition, and our proposition is going to characterize the evolution of labor taxes. So it looks nasty. I'm going to copy it on the next uh, slide, and I'm going to walk you through this formula step by step and try to convince you that there's actually a lot of intuition there. So let's start with the left-hand side. So first, uh, overall, this formula is something that relates, let me call this the labor tax for short. And you see that it's not literally the labor tax, it's a monotone transformation of the labor tax that comes up a lot in public finance. I'm gonna call this object the labor tax in the talk, okay? And you do the caveat in your head. So it's something that relates the labor tax uh, in period T to the labor tax in period T minus one. And we have a lot of formulas in public finance that are of this form, okay? And they're called tax moving formulas. So if you go back to Barrow, for example, in a very different context, it was a context where you have a government and uh, he needs to raise some revenues to finance some expenditures, and it has only distortionary taxes. Okay, the distortionary taxes are assumed and not derived as they are here. And what he found is that taxes should be a random walk. Okay, so you want to smooth taxes over time. If you have a shock that tells you that you're gonna have more expenditure than what you thought, then you should raise taxes in all period to spread the burden of taxation, okay? So it's a formula that would say the expectation of taxes in period T is equal to the tax in period T minus one. It's something that later has been qualified because it depends on a lot of assumptions. So Stokey and Lucas also have a version of tax smoothing that's a bit different, okay? So there's also something that needs to be smoothed, but they find that taxes should not be a random walk. They should uh, instead inherit the stochastic properties uh, the autocorrelation properties of the stochastic process that drives uh, the economy. But basically, you know, these formulas are, are, are pop up in a lot of different contexts, okay? And they're gonna pop up, a, a similar but different uh, thing is going to pop up here. All right, so the left-hand side is the expectation as of 
period t minus 1, of the labor tax rate. Okay. And then there's some risk adjustment. Okay. So you see that the marginal utility of consumption in period t minus 1 and period t features in there. If you use uh, the inverse Euler equation, then uh, you can realize that the expectation of this term is equal to 1. Okay. So you, this is really like a, a risk-adjusted expectation of the labor tax, a weighted average of labor taxes in period t, uh, and the weights depend on what happened in period t minus 1. All right, so we're going to learn, looking from period t minus 1, what the average taxes in period t are going to be like. And the right-hand side is going to tell us that. So the first term uh, tells you that average taxes in period t are going to be anchored at taxes in period t minus 1 hit by a coefficient of mean reversion rho, which is exactly the coefficient of mean reversion of the stochastic process. Okay. So this is a straight tax moving term. Okay. If rho is equal to 1, the case of a geometric random walk, then expected taxes in period t are equal to taxes in period t minus 1. Okay. So this comes from, uh, from, from tax moving. And then the second term tells you that uh, there's going to be something different. It's not just tax moving. So this term is uh, basically reflects the following. So let me tell it in, say it in words, and then I'll, I'll tell you what it corresponds to in terms of the formula. Between period t and period t plus 1, uh, t minus 1 and period t, you have some extra uncertainty that's going to arise. Okay? Extra uncertainty, you'd like to ensure some of this extra uncertainty. That means you want to raise the labor tax a little bit okay, to provide more insurance. There's more risk now. But, uh, of course, there's the benefit of raising labor taxes. There's also a cost in terms of incentives. People are going to work less. And the two components here, the covariance and the alpha, are going to reflect the marginal benefit and the marginal cost of raising labor taxes. The covariance is the margin, marginal benefit of raising labor taxes. Okay? And you can see that it's uh, commensurate with the covariance of the log of productivity and 1 over u prime of ct. 1 over u prime of ct is something that increases with ct. Okay? In the log case, 1 over u prime of ct is just equal to ct. So that would be commensurate with the covariance between productivity and consumption. In general, if you have some concavity in utility, some risk aversion, then this is going to be magnified. Okay? It's going to be the covariance between uh, theta and, and 1 over u prime that's going to matter. And intuitively, that's really what you're trying to prevent okay? in terms of insurance. You have risk. In the first best, you'd like to have everybody have the same consumption. You would insure people. Okay? And the marginal benefit of insurance, if you're away from the first best, is commensurate with the covariance between the consumption of people and their income. As long as there is still some covariance there, there is a marginal benefit of raising labor taxes to try to bring down this covariance, to, br to break the link between uh, consumption and realized income. So that's the marginal benefit of taxation. The marginal cost is very intuitive. It's commensurate with alpha. And alpha is commensurate with the inverse of the Frisch elasticity of labor supply. Okay? So the incentive cost of raising taxes is higher the more elastic is labor supply. Okay? So this term, to the extent that the allocation is monotonic, is always going to be positive. Okay? So stepping back, it's going to tell us that average taxes tomorrow on labor are going to be equal to rho times taxes today and a bit higher than that. In the geometric random walk case, we would expect expected taxes tomorrow to be equal to taxes today plus something. So we would expect taxes to go up over time. Okay? The reason it goes up, once again, is because uncertainty unfolds over time gradually. So there's more uncertainty in period T plus 1 than in period T. Okay, so there's an extra benefit from insurance in period T plus 1 compared to period T. Any questions?
not supposed to do it and then the insurance card is that is this not the right formula to think about a no. field? So I'm showing you one formula. Actually, I could derive a whole bunch of formulas. So here I'm trying to focus on the time series properties of taxes. Okay? But you can, tell, you can see that I'm not telling you anything about the way these taxes vary across the realization of the shock to Mars. Okay? The reason for that is that soon I'm going to write a continuous time version of this model, which is going to be much more tractable to manipulate these formulas. Okay? So I could write not only this formula, but a lot of different formulas with different weighting functions here, which would inform me not only on average taxes tomorrow, but also on when I should expect the tax to be high and when I should expect the tax to be low. I just find it more convenient to do that because uh, in continuous time because I have ETO calculus and I can manipulate those expectations very easily. But I'll tell you about those cross-sectional implications uh, in a minute. So that's, I think, the, the part that's related to the impulse response. Yeah, that's right. That's right, because you want to provide insurance. That's, right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So uh, just to see how this formula behaves in some special cases, let me do the case where theta is predictable. Okay, so there's uncertainty in everything, but between period t minus 1 and period t, there's no additional uncertainty. I can predict the shock theta t for given the information I had in period t minus 1. In that case, the formula that I had on the previous slide collapses to this one. Okay? So, so the tax rate is rho times uh, the tax rate that it was in the period. Okay, if rho is equal to 1, you get perfect tax moving. Okay? If rho is less than 1, then this tau is going to be mean reversing. So see, there you really see the, the impulse response uh, playing. Okay. Now, I did the uh, geometric error one just because it was uh, simple and gave this, this very nice formula. But let me do a bunch of generalization now, and in particular, let me generalize the, the stochastic process. So here it's a general uh, general uh, Markov process, uh, and I'm going to define this object. Okay, so it's the expectation uh, as of a period t minus one of the log of theta t conditional on the information in period t minus 1. So I'm going to be able to generalize my formula to this stochastic process. And basically, the equivalent of rho is going to be this local mean reversion uh, coefficient. OK, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm convinced that it's the same. Huh? I agree. OK? Now. Um, let me do another generalization. I assume so far that we had a fixed support. Okay. And now let me tell you what changes when there's a moving support. So sometimes people get a little confused here. And they think that uh, when there's a moving support, uh, it's an a priori reason to reject the first order approach. Because if you lie in one period, you might not be able to tell the truth in future periods. But that's a complete misconception. Okay, so uh, you can still derive a necessary condition uh, that looks very much like uh, the usual first order condition. I'll tell you exactly how it changes, uh, but there's no uh, there's no real problem. You just have to consider deviations that are slightly different. Okay, the, it's natural to derive the first order approach to consider a deviation where you lie today and you tell the truth tomorrow. But in this environment, if you can't do that, you have to consider other deviations. But you can still consider them and like, take them to be small and can derive a, a necessary condition that's going to look very much like that. Another approach is to extend the allocation. Uh, that, that's what we do, actually. And I guess that's what you had done also uh, yesterday in that case. So you extend the allocation outside the support in an incentive compatible way. And then you don't run into these problems. You can derive the necessary condition. Yeah. 
That's right. No, so yeah, exactly. So I'm assuming that these things are, are smooth enough. So the support is shifting in, in a smooth way. So that's important. OK? So basically, we can derive uh, the same, uh, uh, arrive at a very similar Bellman equation. The only difference is that de delta is going to be defined slightly differently. So this was our definition. Okay, and now because the, the support might be moving around, uh, we inherit some terms uh, that have to do with how the boundaries are shifting. Uh, the boundaries tomorrow, are the, support tomorrow, the boundaries of the support tomorrow are shifting with the shock today. And you can see that I'm assuming that these things are, are well behaved. Okay? But otherwise, you can do the same construction. So to get the first order approach going, I think it's a, it's a very uh, attractive alternative. Uh, I'm going to be interested in deriving some substantive results with those uh, moving supports. So I guess we would get the same with the alternative representation. So here are the results that we're interested in. So a bit of a background before I present these results so that you uh, can put them in perspective. If you take the Merlis model, there's very little you can say in general about the shape of the optimal labor income tax. Uh, and this was a bit surprising to, to Merlis. You know? He thought, I'm going to write down a model where you care about redistribution, and I, I want to get progressive taxes. That's what I expect. And what he did is that he put a log normal, I think, at the time. And he got uh, something that looked pretty much like a flat tax, except at the extremes where it was going to zero. So pretty much like what uh, Ethan had done, but with this qualification that the tax rate has to go to zero at the two extremes. And actually, the, one of the only things that you can derive theoretically uh, in the Merlis model is this result about the extremes, that the tax rate has to be equal to zero at, uh, at the top. That's always true. And at the bottom, if tax rate continues. Okay. So let me try to see what we can say about that result uh, here and the way it generalizes. So here. Uh, this is a shorthand notation for the tax rate. OK, one qualification, another qualification. So here we have histories. So I could talk about the top and the bottom in two different ways. It could be the unconditional top in one period and the unconditional bottom, or the conditional top, conditional uh, realization of a shock yesterday. So I have a characterization for the conditional top and bottom. And that's what I'm presenting here. So uh, this is the tax rate you had yesterday. And this is the tax rate at the top if you have the maximum innovation today, and the tax rate at the bottom if you have the minimal innovation today. Okay. And they're going to be related in the following way. So uh, you can see that uh, there's going to be a bit of a tax smoothing thing. So the tax rate at the top and at the bottom are related to the tax rate yesterday. But then there is uh, a term like this uh, that involves uh, the ratio of marginal utilities and the derivative of the balance. Okay. So again, the impulse response, I guess, would be a bit uh, in there. So let's try to learn uh, from this formula. If you have a fixed support, then these derivatives are 0. Okay? So I get a generalization of the Merlis result that the tax rate is going to be 0 at the extremes. Now, let me do a polar opposite case, okay? which is going to be a case that's going to be interesting for me for applications. Imagine that. Uh, theta is a geometric random walk, but with bounded innovation, so that the support is moving around. Okay, but then these derivatives are equal to one. Okay, the bounds are moving; the support is moving one for one with the shock yesterday. In that case, I'm going to get the following result: that the tax rate today, uh, yes, uh, the tax rate, sorry, at the top today, is going to be below the tax rate yesterday, and the tax rate at the bottom today is going to be above the tax rate yesterday. So it tells you something uh, about the cross-section. Okay? It tells you that uh, So we had a formula that was predicting average 
labor taxes tomorrow as a function of taxes today. And here I'm telling you something at least about the extremes where you should expect some regressivity. Okay? So after a good shock, you're rewarded with lower taxes. After a bad shock, you're, you're punished uh, with high taxes. To be honest, we don't have a fantastic intuition for this result. And so if you guys are inspired, uh, we'll take it. For sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that one, that much I was able to do, <laughs> but I was trying to get something better than that. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, now I want to try to tell you a, a bit more uh, about the cross section, not just about the extremes. Uh, and as I told you, uh, it's going to be much more convenient to manipulate these models and the, the corresponding optimality conditions to work in continuous time. Okay? So uh, I'm not doing it just to be fancy. Okay? I'm doing it really because uh, Itokaki is going to be very powerful and very natural to manipulate uh, those expectations. And second, you'll see that there's a result that I'm going to get only in the continuous time limit. Okay, and a very clean result, and, uh, and that actually when we do our model not in continuous time, it's going to provide a good benchmark. Okay? So it's not just a, a, a gadget. So uh, I'm assuming that productivity follows a uh, general uh, Brownian motion. You can have any kind of mean reversion that you want or, or, uh, or uh, productivity. And I'm going to spare you uh, the methodology. But basically, uh, what we do is, uh, it's very standard in those environments, you first have to derive laws of motions for the state variables V and delta. And then you can derive the hamilton jacobi bellman equation for, for the cost function. And then manipulating this hamilton jacobi bellman equation, you can get first order conditions that uh, can be manipulated into something that looks very much like the discrete time counterpart of what we had before. OK? I, any of you familiar with the continuous time in stochastic calculus or nobody familiar? Kind of not familiar. <laughs> okay, uh, so you know what a Brownian motion is? Okay. It's like a, a random walk but in continuous time. And so dw is the increments of the Brownian motion. So it's a, it's a normal variable. Uh, uh, so this is really a bit like uh, the geometric R1 that I was laying down. Okay, it's a version of that uh, in continuous time. So it's a random process, uh, and it might have some inversion, and the volatility might also be moving around. Okay, uh, and there are uh, methods to uh, deal with the optimization in uh, environments like that, and we're using those methods. <laughs> No. I mean, you can try to make it more bounded by playing with the volatility or the mean reversion, but it's, uh, yeah, exactly right. All right. Uh, how am I going to do this? I'm going to skip that. <laughs> That's how I'm going to do it. <laughs> All right. So we work with the model. It's really nice. And uh, we find uh, a, a formula that's like the continuous time counterpart of our discrete time formula uh, with something new. So let me try it. First convince you that it looks a bit like what we had and like try to emphasize the, the new things. OK, yeah, so you have these D and the dt, okay? So uh, basically, it's like we're looking at the increment of this process over a sh short period of time, okay? And so the increment is going to be uh, uh, scaled by this dt. Now, you're going to see that that's an interesting result to begin with, but let me not uh, go there yet. So lambda is the inverse of the marginal utility of consumption, 
you remember that it's something that appeared uh, in, uh, in the discrete time formula that I had. You know, I had this risk adjustment. I had tau over 1 minus tau, 1 over u prime. Okay, so here, 1 over u prime, tau over 1 minus tau. So we see the same kind of uh, ingredient. And then this term here is really, you know, if you took my uh, discrete time formula and try to say, oh, how does it behave in, con in continuous time, those terms? So when you see a difference, uh, you take the difference to zero to get the derivative and things like that, you would get exactly that. Okay? So there's nothing new there. All right? This is uh, the mean reversion term, okay? the, the term that's related to the impulse response. And this is the term that's related to the fact that you want to provide additional insurance because there's incremental risk between today and tomorrow. Okay? The interesting thing that's nice is that the covariance collapses to uh, just the product here. And that's a feature of, of continuous time. So sigma lambda is the volatility of the inverse of the marginal utility of consumption, the volatility of lambda. And uh, sigma t is just the volatility of the Golden motion. Okay. Uh, but what's surprising and, um, is that, and there you would have uh, maybe to know a bit of uh, stochastic calculus to notice that. There's no volatility term here. Okay. So uh, in principle, you could imagine that this quantity here, uh, when uh, there's different realizations of the Brownian motion, varies a lot with the Brownian motion. Okay? That would be a term that would be in square root of t here. And there's no such term. Okay? So that's uh, a bit of a, a surprise. But what it tells you is one thing, to put it differently, is that the realized path for this variable are going to be of bounded variation. What that means is that they're going to be very smooth, basically. They're not going to vary much. A Brownian motion is not of bounded variation. It's of infinite variation, something that varies a lot. This is a much smoother process than a Brownian motion. Okay. So economically, that's what you learn, that this product here seems to not react to productivity. What that means, really, uh, economically, is when you have a good innovation to the Brownian motion, so you're becoming more productive, then lambda and tau are going to move in opposite direction, one for one. Okay? So it tells you when you have a good innovation to productivity, how consumption and the labor tax are going to be moving. Okay? And basically, consumption is going to go up. Okay? You're becoming more productive. Consumption is going to go up. And the labor tax is going to go down. The labor tax is going to go down exactly by the inverse of lambda. Okay? So economically, this is regressivity. Okay? Good shock, the labor tax goes down. It is something that we saw in the discrete time version at the extremes. But we weren't able to say it more generally. Okay? And now you see that you learn a lot about the cross section. You see exactly how the tax rate is going to respond to innovations uh, to productivity. Good innovations are going to drive the labor tax down. Bad innovations are going to drive the labor tax up. No, I had them only in the case of a fixed support. If I had the moving support one for one, then I had this regressivity result. But it's a different, I, I don't want to say that it's a different result. I just want to say it has a similar flavor. Uh, you know, here it's a global result. Uh, the other thing was about the extreme, and it was qualified by how the extremes are moving. Uh, in some sense, yeah. The same with the bottom, actually. I mean, the, the technical intuition is, is completely straightforward. Yeah. It's, you know, you have an optimal control problem, and the co state has to be zero at the extreme. That's how you derive those results. Yeah. No, so then, you know, so, so that one we haven't done. But uh, th that's the guess that what Oleg was talking about yesterday. So you can do a Pareto tail and try to think, you know, is there going to be some kind of limit? Uh, to the tax rate. So, so we haven't done that here. Yeah.
That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see it with the, the impulse response uh, intuition. But it's another way to understand the, the Merlis result also, the static Merlis result. Yeah. So, so you have to think where this. I, I wouldn't. I, I would certainly not want to have uh, a model where the innovation have unbounded tails. Okay. So the way people usually derive these unbounded tails. Well, we know. All right. Empirically, people who try to understand how labor income shows up over time. Uh, you don't see these fat tails. So the people use actually log normal innovations typically. Okay. Now there's a question as to how log normal innovations like this are going to accumulate over time to produce some kind of distribution for earnings or for wealth and something like that. And you know, there's all this literature about like Zipp's law and everything that tells you that in some cases uh, processes that have log normal innovations can generate fat tails over time. But I think it would be a bad idea to have a model with fat tailed innovations. Okay. So my result is conditional. So the fact that there are fat tails in the overall distribution of earnings is not a problem for me. So all those results would apply. Okay. That's right. It's a bit of a paradoxical result for which I don't have a fantastic intuition. But it's the marginal. It's the marginal. Yeah. But even for the, for the marginal, I'd like to have a good intuition. And I honestly don't. I mean, I have technical intuitions, but I, they don't satisfy me. So if you guys find, uh, I'll give you one, but I, I don't like it. So, uh, so <laughs> look at this product, OK? Uh, it's equal to 1 over u prime minus theta over h prime, OK? Now, uh, at the first best, those two things are equal to each other, OK? So uh, what this bounded variation result is telling you is, OK, at the first best, this would be 0. Away from the first best, you try to stabilize this thing by having it a bounded variation. I don't think it's a great intuition. But honestly, we've tried, and, and we don't have a fantastic one. Now, something that's interesting is that whether this feature, which is definitely a feature of the optimum, whether it's important in practice or not. Okay, So this is where all the history dependence in the tax rates is going to come from. Okay, For a good shock, tax rate goes down. For a bad shock, tax rate goes up. And these things happen in every period. Okay, So you're going to get history dependence uh, in tax rates. So one question that we're going to be able to ask is, is this history dependence important Okay, from a welfare perspective? Or can we just ignore it? So we're going to be able to ask these questions. And, and to preview the result a little bit, what we're going to find is that, at least for the numerical application that we look at, it's not crucial. Okay. No, history dependence in the, in the tax rates. There's history dependence in the allocation. But I want to see if there's history dependence in the tax rates. And here there is. Oh, you have lump sum taxes. Yeah. No, no, but what happens with the revenue? Like this is implementation free. You're asking an implementation question. Welfare is always proportional to productivity. 
Yeah, but it's an, you know, an intuition like this you could use in a static setting, and we know it's not true, so it has to be more complicated than that. But I like that you're trying. <laughs> All right. Uh, so just to tell you also that there's, uh, to see how to manipulate those formulas. So, so this is Ito calculus. So you can compute the evolution of the tax rate directly, okay? And you can see what the, uh, the innovation of the tax rate is going to be as a function of everything. But since you're not so familiar with that, I'm going to skip it. Okay, uh, before I move to, to the simulations, I have, uh, I want to talk a bit about general preferences. So let's do fully general. Uh, we're not going to have the inverse Euler anymore, as we know, so we need separability from them, but that's fine. Uh, we can still characterize the evolution of labor taxes. So one object uh, that we're going to have to introduce is something that shows up a lot uh, in public finance is called the discouragement. So it's the, the partial derivative of the marginal rate of substitution between consumption and leisure with respect to theta. And you can generalize our formula, and I'm showing you the continuous time generalization just for short. Uh, and what you see is that on top of 1 over u prime, you see this discouragement uh, index uh, that shows up. Okay. One interesting case uh, is, uh, is this one. So. Uh, this would fit like balanced gross preferences, uh, for example, but balanced gross preferences that would perhaps be non-separable between consumption and leisure. So the kind of preferences that macro people or PF people like to work with. So if you have something like that, uh, then uh, the discouragement is going to be equal to alpha t, and it's going to be deterministic. And, uh, and then what you're going to see is one extra term in the formula for the evolution of labor taxes over time, which is going to have to do with the fact that the fresh elasticity of labor supply is not necessarily constant over time. Okay, so taxes should go up more in periods where labor supply is inelastic and vice versa uh, when the labor supply uh, is elastic. And there are some people who think that there are, uh, I mean, I think it would be natural that there would be life cycle patterns in the elasticity of labor supply. I don't think we have a great knowledge of, of what these are, but you could see how they would play out. So let me uh, turn to the numerical simulations now. So uh, just to give you an idea, this uh, it's going to be a pretty uh, big simulations, but people who do simpler models, life cycle models, they do things that are a bit more complicated also. So it's a bit of a you know middle scale uh, kind of average scale kind of uh, model, but it's definitely pushing. Uh, the frontier of this new dynamic public finance literature in terms of uh, realism. So we're going to start agents when they're 25. Uh, they're going to leave for 60, work for 40, and retire for 20. Uh, the utility function is going to be of the log balance growth variety, so log utility of consumption. And the Frisch elasticity of labor supply, equal alpha equals to 3, that corresponds to a Frisch of uh, 1 half which is broadly where we think the fresh elasticity of labor supply is. Okay. Um, then for the stochastic process for productivity, I'm going to use a geometric random walk. And I'm going to calibrate uh, using uh, a recent study by Storslet and Felmer and your own uh, that try to uh, uh, empirically really assess uh, this uh, parameter. So that's the kind of variance uh, that they uh, well, this is a slide that's a bit misplaced, but uh, it's just to tell you how to think about initial heterogeneity before I jump into the simulation. So um, imagine you add initial heterogeneity to this model. That's the theta 0. And there's a distribution f0 of theta 0. Then you, c you might say, OK, uh, I'm going to try to put some Pareto weights and maximize a weighted uh, utilitarian welfare function with those Pareto weights, lambda of theta 0. OK, or you can, you're more familiar with the Samuelson way of doing it, and you put a welfare function over the net present value of utility uh, of the different types. <coughs> what would change uh, in the analysis? The only thing that would change is, for our formula, is the initial labor tax rate. Okay? Because you want to do some redistribution, okay? there's a reason uh, to start the tax rate not at 0. Imagine that you do continuous time. In continuous time, if you didn't have this problem, then the tax rate would start at zero and then would grow up over time and stochastically. 
uh, here, it would just change the initial tax rate. Okay? But uh, after that, our formula would apply. Okay? And let me also say that there's a debate. You know, you can't be sure which Pareto weights to use. Okay? But there's no debate when it comes to social insurance. Okay? You have to maximize expected utility. Uh, so there's some ambiguity uh, uh, there. You might be uh, more or less egalitarian or, or less fair. Uh, but there's no ambiguity for, for social insurance. Uh, so we're going to focus on no social insurance uh, with no initial heterogeneity, uh, but it's very easy to extend to a case where uh, uh, you're trying to have, you have some initial heterogeneity and you're trying to do some redistribution. To your model, I guess. Yeah. I think that. No, 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 no. Let, let me say it affects the allocation for sure. Okay. What is not changed is that. So you're going to have some initial tax rates, okay, that are going to be a function of this W or of this lambda theta zero for sure. Okay. But after that, after the initial period, our formula applies. Okay. That's what I wanted to say. That's right. And the analysis. Yeah? It's just that you basically you start with the, uh, so, so this initial, so there's some initial delta, and that's where the distortion tower are coming from, and some initial V, so different promise value of utility. But then you can use the same Bellman equation. No, but you see, this intuition, you could say, I'm going to do Rosian in the Merleys model. And it would apply, but it's, it's, you wouldn't get this regressivity result. So it's, it's not true. No. I don't think so. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. But we don't have this, uh, these assumptions. So, so it's, it's just not this intuition. Uh, yeah. We'll figure it out at some point. <laughs> All right. So let me show you the, the simulations. OK? So what am I plotting here? I'm plotting, uh, so I'm taking a million people and simulating their path. Okay, so they all have different paths. And here I'm plotting the average in every period. So period zero is when they enter the labor force. So they're really 25. Okay, and 40, that's when they retire. They're really 65. So you see that labor taxes start at zero and increase. Okay, average labor taxes and increase in a concave fashion. This is capital taxes, and you see that they decrease over time. And the asymptote, I mean, they become zero uh, at retirement. These are patterns that we can understand. Okay, so what's happening? What's really key is, uh, is the formula. So rho is equal to 1. Okay? So the fact that taxes are increasing over time on average is understandable. Taxes tomorrow, on average, are going to be related to taxes today, plus some term that reflects the fact that there is still some uncertainty between today and tomorrow. So you would expect a shape like this. Why is it uh, concave? Okay? Well, 
Think about it. If you get a productivity shot very close to retirement, it's not going to affect you for many period. And you're going to be able to smooth it uh, in consumption over the whole retirement period. So basically, the variance of consumption is very small here. So the covariance term is going to go to zero as you go to retirement. So this shape is, is perfectly understandable. For capital taxes, it's very related. It's once you understand that the variance of consumption growth is going to go down as you get closer to retirement, then because you know the, the intertemporal wedge is related to Jensen's inequality and the variance of consumption growth, it's very intuitive that this tax on capital should go down over time. Just to, uh, to say, like this is measured as a wedge. So if you want to translate it to a tax on capital the way it's usually discussed, uh, a tax on capital is a tax on the net return to capital, a tax on the interest rate. So uh, it's a much higher tax on capital, as usually reported, it's about the 35%, and it goes uh, down uh, to zero. So he has these uh, these slightly weird preferences that are non-separable between consumption and leisure. So the reason in their model, uh, they're using uh, a utility function over quasi-linear between consumption and leisure. Why do they do that? It's nice because you can uh, actually drop one additional state variable. So numerically, there's a big advantage from doing that. The problem is that these are not really preferences that we work with. Okay. So it's the non-separabilities that are driving their result. They don't have the inverse order equation to put it to things. Uh, we do. So uh, that's the source of, uh, of the difference. Yeah, yeah. So the thing you have to realize is that the variance of consumption is going to go to zero as you go, uh, you get closer to retirement. Why? Because a shock that affects you one second before retirement is going to affect you for one second. It's just not a big shock. So consumption is not going to vary much in response to this shock. Okay. And the tax on capital is related to the variance of consumption. But different, if, if there's no variance in consumption, the inverse Euler and the Euler are the same thing. So there's so the size of the wedge really scales up with risk aversion and the variance of consumption growth. So this thing goes to zero. OK? Now, uh, in terms of, uh, well, this one is probably more interesting. So these are the variances. Uh, of output, uh, consumption, and productivity. Uh, so you see that uh, you really manage to provide quite a bit of insurance. The variance of consumption is much lower than the variance of productivity. Then I want to illustrate the other features of the allocation. So this is going to be uh, trying to talk about tax movement and the drift. So here I'm doing a scatter plot of the tax rate in period 19 and the tax rate in period 20. So age 39. You know, at 25 plus 19 and 25 plus 20. Okay. Uh, what can you see there? You see that the points are clustered around the 45 degree line. That's tax moving. Okay, so the tax rate uh, in period 20 is going to be related to the tax rate in period 19. So you see that they tend to cluster above the 45 degree line. So that's the term that tells you that taxes are going to go up over time because there's extra uncertainty uh, between today uh, and today. This is the same picture in period 39 and 40, so just before retirement. What you see is that it's basically on the 45 degree line now. Why? Because there's very little risk between period 39 and period 40. These shocks are not going to affect you for a very long time. Yeah. No. No, you, you just, if you have an intergenerational model, then you just have to worry about how you treat the different generations, whether they're linked with the bequest motive and things like that. Here I'm doing a life cycle model, so there's no bequest motive. Okay. So the only question is, you might want to do some transfer from one generation to the other, depending on how you care about one generation versus the other. But let me wrap up. We can uh, follow up because I'm running out of time. Okay. Now I want to illustrate the near zero volatility result. So the fact that this thing was of bounded variation. So this is the process that's supposed to be of bounded variation. And I'm, fr I'm plotting in period 19 versus 20. And you can see that it's basically on the 45 degree line with much less 
a dispersion than this graph. Okay? So that's illustrating, uh, despite the fact that we have a discrete time model here, that the continuous time uh, result that we derive is a good approximation. Now I want to illustrate the amount of history dependence and insurance. So this is uh, history dependence. So this is the tax rate in period 20 as a function of productivity in period 20. Okay? And you see that there's a lot of dispersion. That means that there's history dependence. Okay? The tax rate is affected by what happened before uh, period 20. This is trying to illustrate the amount of insurance. So it's a scatter plot of the net present value of consumption and the net present value of output. Okay? So they're on a line, and the slope of that line is roughly, I think, 0.67% uh, uh, or something like that. So it gives you an idea a bit. Uh, I mean, if you had a model with no behavioral responses, it would be like a flat tax of 30%. That would give you uh, a result. Uh, of course, it's not true because there are behavioral responses. Uh, this is an impulse response, uh, so much closer, I guess, to what you guys had. Uh, what's happening is that uh, you have the um, uh, average shock, and then all of a sudden, in this period, you have a good shock to productivity. So this is what's happening to the labor tax over time, and this is what's happening to the capital tax over time. So the labor tax goes down, that's the regressivity, and the capital tax goes up, well, why? Because you provide less insurance, so labor tax goes down. So there's more variance in consumption, and more variance in consumption means more in tax capital. Okay, and let me wrap up with this. Uh, so the simple policies and the welfare gains. So uh, this is the welfare gains relative to a situation with no taxes. I need a baseline to compare uh, welfare to. So no taxes, but people can borrow and save. So they can build a uh, buffer stock of assets. It's not so useful in that model because the shocks are permanent. But anyways. So uh, if you could do the first best, then you would have a huge improvement in welfare, 13%. But you can't do that. The second best, the improvement is still very, very large. It's 3.43%. Okay? If you've ever done any kind of welfare economics, uh, this is a huge number. But that means that uh, these social insurance problems are, are very important. So here, that, so we can go into that discussion, but the, you have lump sum taxes here. You choose not to use only lump sum taxes. But if you just want to collect revenues, uh, it's pretty easy to do so without distortion. Uh, uh, now let me try to talk about these simple policies. So we saw that uh, the features of the optimum was there was history dependence. There was age dependence in taxes. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to simplify. Okay. And in particular, the, the thing that I think makes everybody a bit uncomfortable when, it turns, uh, when it's about mapping it to the making policy recommendations is the history dependence. Okay. It's clear, I mean, we see some of that indirectly in the tax code, but it's not clear it's intended. And it's just uh, a little out there. So let's try to simplify in this dimension. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, go to linear taxes with a lump sum rebate, so a version of Milton Friedman or, or ATAN. But I'm potentially going to allow also linear capital taxes. And I may allow those two taxes to depend on age. Okay? So it's linear taxes on labor and capital, but potentially I'm allowing labor taxes and capital taxes to depend on age. Let's see how they perform. So this is the simulation where with linear labor taxes and linear capital taxes that depend on age. I want to emphasize how simple this is compared to, uh, to the full optimum. Okay? It's a set of linear tax rates, the same for everybody. The only thing is they depend on age. Okay? It's a sophisticated version of the negative income tax, where the rate depends on the age you have. And additionally, you have a tax on capital. You see, compare this number to this number. You get almost all of the welfare gains from this very simple. Okay. And by the way, here, what you can do is, uh, what does it look like, this tax system? The optimal labor tax rates and capital tax rates look very much like the averages I showed you. So increasing labor taxes over time, decreasing capital taxes over time. There's indetectable differences between the optimum linear labor taxes that are age dependent 
and the averages that I showed you. So I could take the averages and plug them in the model, I would find almost the same one. So they are close to optimal. This is shutting down capital taxes, but keeping uh, age-dependent labor taxes. You see that there's some deterioration in welfare, but it's really not that high. So it's reinforcing the conclusion that I tried to uh, uh, emphasize yesterday, that capital taxes are just not that important uh, in those areas. This is a system where uh, I'm allowing a constant capital tax, but still a labor tax. It's okay. Capital taxes are not that important, but maybe uh, there are some benefits from having capital taxes. But is it important to have age-dependent capital taxes? And this is telling you it's not. Okay? You get almost all the welfare gains of age-dependent uh, capital taxes with just a linear capital tax. Okay? And I'm forgetting what the level of this capital tax is, unfortunately. And this is the model where you have a constant labor tax, not age dependent, and a constant capital tax. Okay, the contribution of the constant capital tax is not that large. And what you find is a more significant deterioration in wealth. Okay, but stepping back, you know, you go from 3.43 at the full optimum to 2.71 at, uh, this is really a tens uh, in Milton Friedman's negative income tax. Okay, so it's not a make or break thing. Okay, we're talking about 0.7%. You could make these gains larger by you know, spiking up risk aversion and things like that. But there's a significant improvement, I think. And the message is that I think that simple alterations uh, to the negative income tax, maybe making uh, uh, labor taxes age dependent, seem to deliver most of this improvement. No, no, no. It's no, 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 no. It's not a. Re it's it's a numerical. It's, it's not a theorem. It's it's not true. It's a numerical result. No, I'm, I'm just saying. Oh, okay, so it, it, it doesn't help to improve or to re-optimize. No, no. That's what we do. We start there and then we re-optimize and we find something slightly better, okay. just not much better. And the optimum turns out to be pretty close to the initial point. So it's just a quantitative statement. Those things are not too far apart. Okay. So uh, that's what we have today.